Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Pierce Morgan Live. I'm sure you're able to tell right away that I'm not Pierce Morgan. The way you can tell that for sure is that I don't have a British accent and I don't have a first name that sounds very pointy. <laughs> About a month ago, I got a call from Jeff Zucker asking me to guest host for Pierce Morgan Live, and I had two questions for him. The first was, how the hell did you get my number, Jeff? <laughs> and the second, of course, was, who's Pierce Morgan? Seriously. <laughs> Once I got the answer to those two questions, though, I thought this could be really fun, you know? This could be exciting. This is brand new. It reminded me of the night that I uh, won my first Emmy. It was a magical night. There were... I'm sorry? Oh, I haven't won a damn thing. <laughs> That's right. I forgot. You know what? Maybe I'll win an Emmy for my performance here today. What's that? Not a chance. <laughs> Who's talking into my ear? Because they're, they're real glasses half empty. Kind of voice in my ear. I want you to know that I'm not accustomed to reporting the news, but should any breaking news stories come in, I'll do my utmost to report them to you. I'm sorry. Oh, this just in. <laughs> oh, yes, the royal baby is still a boy. Still a boy, which is also the title of my forthcoming autobiography. So, instead of Pierce Morgan live, tonight it will be Matthew Perry with, you know, uh, an hour delay. We're going to have lots of fun tonight. We're going to be educated on some topics. And my hope is that we'll all learn a little bit about ourselves. Later, my good friend Lauren Graham will be here. You know her from Gilmore Girls and Parenthood. And she's got a New York Times bestseller. We'll also be speaking with some experts about alcoholism, addiction, and my favorite topic these days, drug court. But first up, she is beautiful. She's intelligent. She's hilarious. And if memory serves, she owes me uh, $47. Oops. You remember that? Oops. The two steak sandwiches? Yep. Uh, you want to? I don't have it talk, on me. We'll talk about it later. Or She's the executive producer of Web Therapy, and who do you think you are? Please welcome one of my favorite people in the whole wide world. You may remember her as being the second funniest cast member on Friends. Emmy winner, Lisa Kudrow. Lisa, <laughs> thank you for being here. Thank you for giving me second. Oh, yeah. Well, it, it was tough, because first is so easy. And right. then you have to watch the episodes to, right, right. to know. To figure out. Yeah. But uh, congratulations. Thank you. Know, you you uh, next to the best. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Here's something that's cool. The producers asked us to pick our favorite scene that mm -hmm. we were in together. And independent of one another, we picked the same scene. So right. let's get started and we'll show that scene from the Friendship Show, ladies and gentlemen. So there's nothing left for us to do but, but kiss. <laughs> Here it comes. <laughs> our first kiss. I can't have sex with you. And why not? Because I'm in love with Monica. You're, you're what? Wow. So, that's interesting to watch. Oh my God. That was hilarious. Look how much fun we were having. I know. That was the first, because you were the only guy I hadn't kissed on the show. Really? You'd kissed everyone else? Everyone who ever walked on the set. I yeah, think Phoebe. Yeah. That Phoebe was our was, show. Yeah. I didn't remember that. <laughs> Phoebe was kind of easy. Is that the... Uh, yeah, really? Easy Phoebe? Every time we'd read a script... You, or one of the guys, mostly you, would just say, be easier. Be looser, be slutty. <laughs> yes. Well, at least, I guess we can now ask, who was the best kisser? And don't say me, just because I'm sitting here. But don't say not me, because I'm sitting here. Okay. Say it's me. It's you. It's me. Great. And Thank then... you. Uh, people are always asking me, do I watch the show? And I, I don't really watch the show. It's odd. I don't yeah. watch it. Do you watch? No, no, not much. Yeah. Not much. It's hard. If I see that it's on, I have to check my mood. I don't know if you're the same way. If I'm, if I'm in a bad mood, I'm not going to like seeing myself at all. Right. right? And, but if you're in a good mood, if you'll I'm like in a it. good mood, I'm like, oh, not bad. Let me but, tell you but, this. But I no, think yes. all of you guys are hilarious every time. I'm like, God, they're talented. My God, they're so funny. Well, why did I suck so yeah, much? That's the neurosis. Of, that's why we're all not plumbers. That's right. why we're actors and neurotic and needy. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> Well, That's good fun. night. That's fun. <laughs> so I was doing a Hollywood Reporter interview a couple of weeks ago, or like a month ago, and it was one of those, hey, I hope I get nominated for an Emmy interviews. Mm -hmm. I did not. It did not work. Oh. But I still had to do the interview. And um, I found myself sort of reminiscing about how much fun the show was and, 
you know, the hours that we worked and how much, you know, you could see how much we laughed and everything. And I found myself saying, if I could, if I had a time machine, I would like to go back to 2004 and not have stopped. Oh. You know? Yeah, So no. I found that, so just assuming for a second that time machines are just around. Okay. Would you get in a time machine and, and, and have stopped? Would you want to change that or... Yeah, I mean, if we, if it were up to us, yeah, you know, like individually, yeah, then yeah, you would have kept going, or you would have stopped. Oh, I would keep going. Yeah, I mean, I figured, you know, there was probably there would have come a time anyway, yeah, when someone would have said we've had enough, right? Um, but why not have fun until they do? Yeah, I guess the ideology was that like we would decide. Because that would be better. But right. I disagree. Right. I, looking back, no, don't make us decide. Let's keep going. <laughs> it's the greatest job in the world. It was. No, I mean, you know, we had a lot of fun. It was yeah. just really fun. But I think we were extremely appreciative at the time, by the way. It's not yeah. like, you know, we did not appreciate how fun it was, how good the writing was. What We were all very proud and appreciative. We definitely yeah. knew we were a part of something special yeah. and we're very grateful the whole time. But I, I think just in that, in that meeting where we all said, let's stop, I, I probably would have said, hey, let's not stop, <laughs> you know? Yeah, me too. All right, so I want to talk to you about web therapy for a second, which is hilarious. Oh, but, thanks. Uh, uh, hilarious. Wow. Really, really funny. Um, Matthew thinks it's hilarious. Oh, yeah, and it's not this earpiece guy. I, actually I know, you that. actually checked in, I'm like, really? Yeah. Hilarious? It was Do hilarious, I go that far? I was supposed to say, or hysterical? <laughs> um, and I think this is interesting. I, don't know, I, I find you to be, quite honestly, one of the most intelligent actors I've ever worked with. Thanks, really? And, yes, I do. Wow. And I notice, though, that you always play characters. You kind of gravitate toward characters that aren't so intelligent right. sometimes. Now, are you trying to play against yourself, or do you need me to explain this question to you over again? <laughs> But um, I think no, because I think one of my biggest fears is that I am an idiot and always missing oh, the point. Yeah, but that's not the case. And at all. well, you yeah. know, one of my fears. Oops. But I think it's funny that people when there are people who aren't aware of how they come off, that they think they're really you know pulling it off. Right. So that's right. funny to me. Yes, that and you're hilarious doing it. Thank but in you. life, and you know, I, I, you're you, you're very smart. So you're playing you're playing against type, whereas I just keep playing myself. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah on luckily. On very short-running TV shows. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I know, but I love your shows. You do? Yeah. Thank you. But you're really likable and funny, and kind of that's all you need. Do you know what I mean? You're really... All you need to what? What? All you need to what? All you need to succeed, to it be is? appealing, to okay. have people want to watch you, because you're extremely funny. I mean, I think the hardest I ever laughed was with you. Oh, yeah? On the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, uh, we laughed For a sure. lot, and <laughs> we're going to maybe show a little bit of that uh, laughing okay. in, a, in a second. So the show is uh, hilarious, Thank and you. I want to take a look at a couple of uh, scenes from that. So let's do that. Thanks. I have a memory of our future. Really? Aren't you leaving? I thought you were going back. I love you so much. That's soon. I'm sorry, that sounds strange well i don't think it's strange it's not like i haven't experienced <laughs> someone falling in love with me before that is uh <laughs> steve carell hilarious yeah. and um you know who i did not see in that clip package who me oh <laughs> you know <laughs> you did you notice yet. that i did i've well, noticed yeah. it every time we shoot that i'm not there yeah see i know i'm very busy I'm I very busy because I'm guest hosting Pierce Morgan, but th right. that's over in like 35 minutes. Okay. And then I got nothing. <laughs> so can I come on? And Yes. I okay. mean, yes. I mean, I, I thought that was definitely going to happen. I mean, the okay. first second I ever heard you say, I think that's funny. I was like, okay, I got to ask him to do it. Oh, great. If he likes it, he has to do it. That would be great. Oh, my God. All right, Lisa, when we come back, I want to play a uh, little game that I hope becomes a regular thing in my one-time guest hosting thing here. <laughs> it's called... Uh, how well do you know your own project? Oh. So I'm going to ask you questions about your own project. Okay. It also looks like it's like Howdy Kiep. So let's play Howdy Kiep <laughs> when we come back. Okay. What? That's terrible. No, it's not. We do it every year. And we've never founded them. We've never founded them. No. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, um, no, you didn't. I did. Oh, uh, uh, oh, no, 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 uh, uh, uh. <laughs> oh, and I brought Operation. 
but um, I lost the, um, it's making a noise. <laughs> Chandler is doing his sex face. <laughs> Just for now, don't make any faces. <laughs>go on this journey because I've watched my father be in a lot of pain not knowing who he is. Hop into a world filled with swastikas gives you a little bit of a chill. Can't believe it's my family. It's outrageous. Can't believe it. This is a thousand years ago. This is incredible. So that's a very interesting uh, show that you have as well and we're going to talk about that in a minute. First of all I wanted to tell you one of the highlights of the last few seasons of Friends was playing with Julian up there. You know I play with them all the time. And I just wanted to check in, like, how do, you, how do you have time to do all of this? You're doing a lot of things. Well, yes, but the things are all um, sort of nine to five-ish. Even web therapy, I have to say, we only shoot, like, when you do it, you'll see. Yeah. We only need you for half a day. Okay. Right, so in one weekend, and we only shoot it in the week, on the weekend because that's when we can get our crew who's busy doing real shows. How much will shows. I get for that? Is that the same thing we were making, what we were making before? Well, $900 oh, of what less. we were making before. That's less. That's less. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. a little less. Uh, and so how is Michelle? How's Julian? How's, how's everything going over there? Good. Yeah? They're both fantastic. They're good. really good. Um, your other show, let's talk about uh, who do you think you are for yeah. a second. Uh, this season you've got great guests. You've yeah. got uh, Zoe Deschanel and oh, Cindy, yeah. uh, Cindy Crawford and Christina Applegate. So is the rule this year just attractive? Just attractive people That's get to right. be on. Yes. If you're unattractive, we don't care who you think you are. That's right. Is that what is that what it's going to say? That's on that exactly. That's thing? exactly what the tagline is. Yeah. For, uh, so yeah. that was just a rule. Just attractive women, <laughs> all over the place. No, Chris O'Donnell and Jim Parsons. Oh too. well, they're unattractive. They're <laughs> yeah. Is that what you mean? <laughs> no. Anyway, and Chris O'Donnell um, and Jim Parsons have fantastic stories too by the way well that's so, what i wanted to ask you what, yeah. is, what some are some of the, of the interesting secrets that you've that you found out we have like i am not allowed to give too much away but in this season we find documents for people that are written in their ancestors own hand right from like uh, over a hundred years ago wow. or more we have documents like oh it's trisha yearwood i'm giving it away a little bit one of her ancestors we have an account from a companion this is in the 16 somethings years 1600 um of how that person was feeling you know an, yeah. an account of that that you can have those records just like yeah he was feeling pretty bad because that you that a person gets to see their own ancestors like thoughts do you fake them down do you fake them no absolutely that sounds not like you could easily fake them this I, was written by your great grandmother right <laughs> uh in the elizabethan area where they only had pink paper <laughs> no you don't fake them we do not we yeah. absolutely do not we have real academics doing our research they would never do that okay yeah. You like producing? You like uh, being uh, behind the scenes or in I front? like it for who do you think you are? Yeah. A lot. Just cuz I like getting to learn that history cuz I get like a full download from our researchers, you know, about yeah. historical events and stuff. But um, I just I learned so much doing that show too. Like Zoe de Chanel. I mean, I thought I knew what I needed to know about Quakers. Her family she <laughs> right. comes from a long line sure. of Quakers. Yeah. But I didn't realize that they were so progressive. Women had an equal say, you know, in all of their meetings and in policy and stuff like that. And I mean, that's at a time when they didn't have the right to vote, you know, weren't allowed to divorce in the whole rest of the country. Right. So very progressive. And then their position on abolition was just way ahead of everybody else. Well, it's, it's really interesting. So I want to play a game with you. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, good. It's, uh, it's called uh, How to Key Up. As I said before, right. which is just a, it's, those are just the words, the first letters for how well do you know your own project. Okay. And if you win, I'm going to ask you a couple questions. Okay. If you win, you get them all right. Yeah. I'm going to sign a copy of uh, one of your DVDs for you and give it back to you. Hey! Isn't that great? Well, that would be worth a lot, actually. Okay. Here we go. How well do you know yourself? How do you key up? Lisa okay. Kudrow. Yeah. In your second season of Who Do You Think You Are, which celebrity garnered the most viewers for you? What was the most successful one that got the most viewers? I know that answer. Do you? I mean, I knew that answer. Well, then answer. say it. Use, well. your, use your brain and your mouth to say it. <laughs> They're not working together. Um, it was um, 
Damn. You don't have the answer. I don't. It's I Vanessa it, Williams. Vanessa Williams. Vanessa Williams, okay. which you're most successful. Right. Okay, so that's uh, uh, 0 for 1. That's... Right. Do you think Meryl Streep is more proud of her performance in Web Therapy or Sophie's Choice? Oh, Web Therapy. Web Therapy. Because it's comedy. Comedy's harder. Yeah, it is harder. And plus, that movie, <laughs> I didn't see that movie, but is that whole movie just her going... Uh, that one. No. It's, uh, there's other stuff in that? There's a lot of other difficult stuff in it. Meeny, meeny, miny. And okay, she did it one. with a Polish accent. Oh, okay. All right, question three. It's a visual question. Oh, okay. Which I think is fun. We're going to show you a scene <laughs> from Cheers that you were on. Oh. Okay? Yeah. So let's watch. You on Cheers? Try improvising a little. We'll get on our ladders, and we'll just say whatever we think our characters are thinking. And remember, George and Emily are two innocent kids playing around with love. They're consumed by the fire of their passion, don't you think? Okay, well, there's a lot to say about that. That was, that was fantastic. <laughs> oh. Do you know, it was. Uh -huh. Even then, you were perfect. Perfect, pitch perfect, perfect. perfect. Pitch yeah. perfect. Do you know the name of the, of the title of that episode? What that episode was called? Oh, wow, I don't know. It's something to do with Our Town and Emily and that episode. Oh, Boyd, something one Boyd for two girls or two girls for one Boyd? What? I don't know the... We, oh. Oh, that's right. That's right? That's right. That's right. Two girls for one boy. Right. I'm never right. Wow. That's right. So, you got two answers out of three correctly, so you win. Huh? And what you win is, uh, thank you very much, <gasps> the Lovely Friends uh, DVD, all ten seasons. God. That's and I'm great. going to sign, sign it, it for you. That's very valuable. To Lisa, yeah. keep reaching. For the stars. <laughs> Matthew Thank Perry. You. And then, you know, Sorry. track down the other four and you got a whole thing. Hey! Yeah. Okay, Web Therapy airs Tuesday at 11 p.m. on Showtime. And Who Do You Think You Are airs Tuesdays at 9 on TLC. When we come back, we'll be talking about another big part of my life, alcoholism, addiction, and recovery. And we'll have a few experts joining me to talk about that. And trust me, that segment is going to be hilarious. I'm Matthew Perry, guest hosting for Pierce Morgan. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit. There are a lot of uh, misconceptions about alcoholism and addiction, and my next guest is an expert. He's Dr. David Sack, CEO of Promises Treatment Centers and Elements Behavioral Health. Welcome, Dr. Sack. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. Uh, so um, I wanted to ask you a couple of question just in the simplest form uh, a lot of people think that addiction is a choice a lot of people think it's a matter of will that has not been my experience uh, I don't find it to have anything to do with strength uh, but I was hoping that you could lay out for us just in layman's terms talk about addiction and alcoholism and what's going on there sure well you know half of the people in the United States over the age of 12 drink so alcohol is a very common phenomenon but when you look at who has a problem with alcohol, it's only about 4% or 1 out of 25 people. We now know that there are important differences between people who have problems with a drug or alcohol and people who don't. So that genetic factors probably account for half of all of that risk. Meaning that who your parents are, how you raise those things contribute dramatically to whether or not someone's going to have an alcohol problem. You know, to, it is a choice to go for treatment or to not go for treatment, but the, the issue of how you respond to a drug or alcohol depends on your makeup, and that makeup is largely genetically determined. Okay, yeah, and so let's, let's talk about that. Um, it's my understanding that uh, it's a two-faceted disease. It's an obsession of the brain and an allergy of the body. I will let you jump in any time if I say okay. something incorrect, that it is a disease that the American right. Medi Medical Association in 1956 de deemed it so. So what's going on just with the body and the mind of an alcoholic? Sure. Well, the original concept of this allergy of, of the body really was the idea that people who become alcoholic respond to alcohol differently. Science has sort of caught up with AA in the big book, and we know that there are two different ways that they respond differently. One is, is that they're actually less sensitive to the toxic effects of alcohol. So they get more of a buzz, more of a high, they're yeah. enjoying themselves more. And the other is they develop craving. 
that, that people like me who don't become alcoholics, we have a drink and we get sleepy, get a little relaxed, we go to bed. But people who are prone to alcoholism actually start to crave the drug after they're exposed. And we can actually show that these differences are driven by differences in how they absorb and metabolize alcohol and are different across countries and cultures. Yeah, I, I often noted that, uh, to me, I always had this theory, and it's just my theory, uh, <laughs> that um, if, if a normal drinker has a martini, they feel a little dizzy and they feel a little goofy. If I have a martini, for the first time in my whole life, the world makes sense. Uh -huh. the first, I feel comfortable where I'm standing, and I've always had this theory that if alcohol felt to me like it did to you or to a normal man, they'd be drunk all the time, too. Well, I think that's right. You can only become uh, addicted to a drug that gets you high in some way, normalizes you, get, makes you euphoric, gives you a buzz. And those things are very different. Um, we know that the people who are more likely to become alcoholics actually metabolize alcohol a little bit more slowly, so they have more of it around. Whereas people like me, we metabolize it quickly and we get the toxic effects of alcohol. So we start to feel nauseated, dizzy, headachy, and so we don't have much reason to keep drinking. Now, we, uh, we lost a uh, very talented actor last week, Corey Monteith, passed away presumably from drug use. And uh, what could have been done to save, save this guy? What, what, could, what could have been done? Well, you know, Corey had been in treatment before. He was in treatment recently. Um, according to news reports, it was an overdose of heroin combined with alcohol. You know, that is probably the most dangerous combination. You know, and when you look at the treatment for heroin, there are medicines that can specifically block the effect of heroin so that if somebody goes out and uses, they won't overdose. And one of those medicines is called Vivitrol and naltrexone. And really, one of the problems that we have right now is that it's vastly underused, that clients don't want an injection, uh, families don't think it's going to be necessary. Yeah, I, I, I noticed that for me, I, I, I never... The fact that I never tried heroin is mm -hmm. the only reason I'm able to sit here. I'm mm -hmm. positive. If I, if I had tried that, I would not be around. Uh, and there seems to be a lot of, a lot of drugs are going down, but, but prescription, prescription pills and heroin is on the rise. It seems to me there's a little bit of a heroin epidemic going on. When I was in high school, there was pot in our lockers, and now there's heroin. Well, the real epidemic is in prescription opiates, which belong to the same general category as heroin. And, you know, really and truly, uh, the increase in overdose deaths is directly related to doctors prescribing and overprescribing uh, pain medications to people with drug and alcohol problems who then go on to become addicted. Um, you know, the, the reality is that drugs uh, go in cycles. You know, we have an epidemic of amphetamines, and we have an epidemic of cocaine, and we have an epidemic of opiates. But in this particular case, um, the availability of prescription opiates is what's driving this epidemic. H half the people who start report that they got the drugs for free from a friend or a relative. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I know that no person could have made me stop. You know, no person could, and as Dudley Moore said in Arthur, it would have to be a very big person <laughs> that could make me stop. Dr. Sachs, stay with me. Uh, coming up next, we're going to talk about an effective way to keep addicts out of jail and save lives. And guess what? It's bipartisan. And so am I. Seventy-five percent of people who complete drug court never see another pair of handcuffs. Never see another pair of handcuffs. I'll never see another pair of handcuffs. I'm Matthew Perry in for Pierce Morgan. Welcome back. It's drug court time. Back with me now, Dr. David Sack, CEO of Promises Treatment Centers, and joining us, Alby Zweig, who went through the drug court system back in the 90s, and West Huddleston, the CEO of the National Association of Drug Court Professionals. So welcome, guys. Thank you. So uh, let's start things off, Wes, just in its simplest terms. Tell us what, what is drug court? Yeah, well, a drug court is a life-saving courtroom that's staffed by criminal justice professionals who are specially trained to actually treat addiction and mental illness. And it's unlike any courtroom you've ever seen in that the judge, the prosecutor, the defense attorney, probation, treatment professionals, everyone gets together and they actually work as a team to actually try to help drug-addicted offenders get their lives back and get clean and sober. So this is for primary, it's for uh, first time 
nonviolent drug offenders, correct? Yeah. Well, well, I could say that's slower. <laughs> <laughs> but that's who it, that's who it's for primarily, right? It, it, actually, it's it's for um, offenders who are really pretty seriously engaged in the criminal justice system. They they may have been on probation okay. many times or in and out of jail. The key is that they're seriously addicted to drugs and nothing else is working. And so this team, this drug court team, actually fashions a sentence or fashions a um, uh, a plea agreement that connects them to treatment services that truly helps get get them the life back. Great. Uh, and what is the success rate of drug court? Well, 75% uh, of our graduates never see another pair of handcuffs. We just heard that in, in the PSA, but really that doesn't tell the entire story. Um, actually, um, we cut crime in half compared to jail and prison. So we literally can cut crime up to 50% in a community by using this drug court model versus sending somebody to prison who's addicted. And that saves taxpayers an absolute ton of money because uh, you know, offenders are not being rearrested, they're not victimizing yeah. society, and it saves a ton of money. So we have a thing that saves lives and it saves money. Yeah. There's not too many of those around. We yeah. have uh, a success story here that I want to tell you about today. We have Albie Zweig, who went through the drug court system, uh, as I said, back in the 90s. And uh, so you were a hope-to-die, on-the-streets heroin addict. Correct. And last week at the drug convention in Washington, you stood up next to your wife and your little baby. Right. Uh, so how did that happen? How did you get from there to now here, sitting here on CNN? Well, it's a long story. Um, but basically, you know, I had a, a really uh, vicious heroin and cocaine addiction. Um, I was distraught. Uh, I was arrested. I was charged with a felony. I was facing 4 to 12 years. Um, I didn't know what to do. Uh, there was a part of me that had given up all hope because I had tried to quit so many times. I'd been through rehabs, I'd been through methadone maintenance, uh, I'd been through the withdrawals. Um, I was desperate, but I ended up going and speaking to my parents one last time. And I remember my mom saw right through what I was doing. Um, and she said, you know, if you die, we're the ones who suffer, right? We're the ones who are left to pick up the pieces here. Um, and so that was sort of a, that was a huge moment for me. And I said I would try one more time. Uh, and I was lucky because I was put into a drug court and the stability and the structure of drug court um, changed something. And I started to have pieces of my life that I had lost come back to me. I had the opportunity to go to law school. Um, that led to a job in the same public defender's office um, that had represented me in my case. And this February, I was appointed as a magistrate in the same court that had really helped to save my life 20 years before. People who managed to take care of their addictions uh, enjoy unimaginable success. And stories like that that fuel my engine because I want stories like that to get as much ink and as much press as the tragedies that we, uh, that we read about as well because there is a lot of hope. There is a tremendous amount of hope and people yeah. change. And uh, I think I, I, want, I want that message out there just as much as the negative things that are out there. So yeah, it, let me ask one of you, uh, if you, what advice do you have for families that uh, are, and loved ones uh, that, uh, that have, you know, that their, their father is drinking too much, that somebody in their family or a loved one is clearly in need of treatment? What, what do you think those guys should do? I would say seek treatment, seek a professional um, uh, as quickly as possible. Treatment works and people do recover. Millions of people recover every year from, from this disease. Yeah, so, uh, so get them into treatment. There's yeah. a myth that, it, that someone has to choose the day they're going to go to treatment, that somehow they're going to wake up that morning and they're going to say, this is a good day to get sober. And what we've learned from the drug courts, from physician programs, and from pilots programs, is that when there's a consequence, it motivates people to get treated. Families can't wait for the right moment. They have to fight to try to get their relative to agree to go. And they have to push for that if they want to be successful. Yeah, it's really difficult because in my case, there were, as I said, there was no person that could make me go. I had gigantic consequences if I continued drinking there was but there was no person it 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 it, it happened for me when I when I went oh my goodness I'm, I'm gonna die from this tomorrow if I don't get in so but there is a little window that opens for people right, right. And you just gotta time it exactly right yeah and for drug court that moment is a pair of handcuffs and people come into the criminal justice system they're not volunteering yeah. they're literally coming in in handcuffs Thank God there's, there, there are judges that actually care about what happens to them and will monitor that case all the way through treatment. And in drug court, what we do, the kind of the magic is we, 
we, we bring the participant back in front of the judge to get checkups every week or every two weeks. Yeah. The judge is able you know, to really monitor and, and adjust the treatment plan as needed. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, a huge, uh, that's a huge point, is that we know when the, when the offender comes back, we have drug test results. We, um, we have a probation officer there who can tell us how the offender's been doing. So if the individual isn't doing what they're supposed to be doing, we can sanction or we can punish quickly. Um, and that quick sanction is what really helps to modify a person's behavior. And when we go to, uh, to Washington and we walk through the halls of the White House, everybody loves this idea. It's bipartisan. Republicans love it. Democrats love it. But I did want to at least give voice to, uh, not everyone loves it. There, there, must be, there must be people that are not for drug court. For, for those people, who are they? Who's not on the drug court side? And what is their argument? Well, they, they really are one of two camps. One camp says that really all drugs should be legal. They're, they're, uh, heroin, uh, methamphetamine, cocaine should be legal, and their criticism is that drug court is a criminal justice response, and uh, they just believe it's bad policy. Hmm. Um, on, on the other hand, we have prosecutors, some prosecutors and some law enforcement officials who, as you and Dr. Sack so eloquently discussed right before this segment, just believe that addicts are bad people, that they're weak and they should yeah. be punished and incarcerated. And they're really turning a blind eye to the research that this is a disease and that it's treatable. So those are really the two camps that are against us. My biggest concern about drug court is that we're not reaching enough people. We're reaching, you know, a, about 140,000 people on any given day in America, and there's 100, there's uh, 1.2 million people that need us. 1.2 million. Well, how many people have we saved? Well, in the past 24 years, we've saved a million people. Saved literally, a million people's literally lives. Literally, a million people have gone through drug court. That is fantastic. For more information on drug courts, go to allrise.org. Coming up, the star of Parenthood and Gilmore Girls, Lauren Graham. Thanks, guys. Flirting with the guy. I was being chatty and flirty. I have a personality. I had Come pudding on, and, Look, it's a different and kind lunch. Of workplace. It was okay, lunch. It's not a bar. Oh, don't say that to me. I know it's not a bar. You don't have to tell me it's not a bar. I know how to Sarah, conduct myself outside of a bar. Sarah, you're my little sister. Okay, this guy bar. is a dog. Okay, He's not I know a good guy for you to get involved by with, myself, okay? For myself. I don't need your help. That was Lauren Graham yelling in the first season of Parenthood. You also know her from Gilmore Girls, but let's take a look at some of uh, her earlier work, shall we? There are over 200 adjectives to describe taste. Consider lean cuisine dictionary. I think men and women should share household chores. Don't you? You got my name from Uncle Al. Switch from AT&T? Oh, please, I'm getting married. You know what's funny about that is that your gigantic head in that clip is only matched by how large... You're like you. You look like a giant right now because of the in the studio. There's nothing going on in the studio that's not your head. How are I asked you? them to pull back. I can see it. I'm fine. And uh, I thought it was frightening. I'm sorry if I'm frightening the royal baby and whoever else. Yeah. No. You look. You look beautiful. You look beautiful. It's Thank just you. The, no. It's it, it. It's just the size of the wall I'm that just they a have giant. you on. No. No. Mm. No. No. Yeah. No. <laughs> right. All right. Yeah. Now listen. You look wonderful, and you're doing a very good job at your new job that lasts for one night. Thank you. Yes. It's over in about six minutes. Oh, all right. Yeah. Well, let's I, talk about let's it. Let's hope it goes well. Let's hope it goes well. Yeah. So, uh, you now are a New York best-selling author, New York Times best-selling author. Is that right? So I figure that, you're pretty that is much right. that happened. Yeah, you're pretty much going to be impossible to talk to from now on, right? <laughs> you know. Um, it was an incredible thrill. I mean, yeah. I, I honestly, we've both been actors long enough that. You need, you need something uh, new, a new incredible thrill. And, and um, it was really a nice compliment and, and surprising. So it was very, it was a good, that was a good day. So I'm going to ask you a question now because I knew you back, uh, I met you back in, uh, I think, 2002. Where you were doing Gilmore Girls. And uh, yep. they were very strict on the script with you on that show. And now you're doing Parenthood where I hear it's, it's looser. Do you, do you like that a lot better? You know, every job is its own animal, I guess, and, and you just sort of have to learn the, the world. And the world of Gilmore Girls, yes, was very musical and precise, and the world of parenthood is more, you know, it's about a family. They want it to sound messy and 
and overlap and they shoot it in a way that we can do that, it's still written very beautifully, but it's a totally different way of working. I like, I kind of like them both. I think when you're doing one, you crave the other, like, I, you know, but um, I, I've really enjoyed the freedom on Parenthood to kind of um, improvise has been really fun. Yeah, well, it comes out great. I mean, it's, it's a great show. It's Thanks. hilarious. You're wonderful in it. And uh, it's an ensemble, though which you're not used to, you're usually yeah. the lead. Is that why you wrote the book? So you could just prove that you're better than everybody? <laughs> Is that why you did it? I, I look at it more uh, as I had time, given that it is a wonderful ensemble, to uh, stretch my wings in another way, and I'm very grateful to have had that time. But, you know, I think we're similar in... in we're, it's it's hard to I don't like to not have something that I'm doing uh, and and I like to work and I like to be busy and and this is something that I that I can do you know without waiting for someone to call action or cut and so it started as a project completely for myself I did never intended to show it to anybody but then I did and okay. so I'm I'm glad I did stretch my wings. <laughs> <clears throat> So Ew, let me is that ask the you, dumbest thing no, I ever No, it's just said. amazing that it works, though, because you really are a best-selling author. It actually works. Right. But Do you want to play a game? Yeah. You want to play a quick game? Okay. This is a game okay. that I've been playing this now, and I hope it's sort of my staple thing on the show that I'm only going to mm. do once. <laughs> okay. You know? And it's called... Uh, <laughs> it's how, a running gag. It's called How Well Do You Know Your Own Project? Okay? Okay. Which I also, oh, no. I call it like howdy key up. Because those are the first. <laughs> so let's play a quick Very game of howdy key up. All right, so I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about your projects. Mm -hmm. What is the first word in your book, someday, someday, maybe? What's the first word? Begin. Very good. Yes, it is. Thank you. And that's how far I got. No, I'm joking. I'm, I'm completely oh. kidding. No, I read much more than that. Okay. So, uh, now, here's something, here's something you may not know. On Kindle, what they do is they tell you how many people have highlighted certain sections from the book. Did you know that? Yeah. So, no, this gives me the willies, yeah. No, no, no. So, they just, you know, people who are reading the book, they like this line and they highlight it. So, what do you think is the most highlighted line from your book? I will tell you this as a clue. It got 56 highlights. Um, something about uh, I must not continuously seek approval from the people whose approval I'm not even sure I want? Yes. That's it. Really? Fantastic. The crowd really? is going wild here. That's exactly <laughs> right. That got the most uh, underlines. And I think it's a very funny, great line. So you are going to... Uh, so thank here. you so much. That's good. So here. What do I win? Your book. You see this? <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to get rid of that. Because <laughs> you don't need that, right? Just repeating. Oh, my God. And I'm going to sign it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Reach for the stars. <laughs> Matthew oh, Perry. No. And then I'll just oh, have this given wow. to you. Parenthood returns this fall on NBC. And someday, someday maybe, is available now. <laughs> we'll be right back. Lauren, thank you. I love you. Goodbye. I love you, too. <laughs> Before we go, I want to share something with you. My favorite six words in recovery are trust God, clean house, and help others. My way to honor those words is I recently transformed my home into a sober living house. And here is my good friend and the number one interventionist in the country, Earl Hightower, who is now going to open the doors of Perry House. Earl? My name is Earl Hightower. Welcome to Perry House. Please come in. The owner of the house, Matthew Perry, came to me and said, I live in a different house, and I would like this house to have meaning and purpose. Let's do some good with this, this house. But you come here, and you learn how to live sober, the experience of living life sober on life's terms, not yours, but on life's. And that takes time. There's no shortcut to that. Morning meditation gathering for the day. What's up with your day? This would be the place where that would occur, this living, the living room area. I'll stack up what we do here and who we do it with. It's not just the services that we provide, 
but the individuals that communicate that service, I'll stack that up against anybody in the world. We're good at what we do, and I'm very proud of that. Wow, that's a really nice house. What did I do that for? I guess it's a good cause, tax deductible. What's that? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm being told I'm speaking to myself in front of millions of people. It's Pierce Morgan, that would be thousands of people. Well, this has been Matthew Perry with, you know, an hour delay. I'd like to thank my guests, Lauren Graham, Judge Albie Zweig, Wes Huddleston, Dr. David Sack, and of course, Lisa Kudrow. So thank you, Pierce, for the opportunity. I love you, I love you. I love you so much. I love you, Pierce Morgan. No, I'm not gonna blow the kiss. We talked about that. I'm not gonna blow the kiss. Okay, let's just end the show.